going to do you a favor, my brother. I'm going to leave it to you. Because if, I, if, 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 if it comes out of my mouth, if it comes out of my mouth, and I sit up there and I literally articulate, I'm going to lose my mind. I ain't going to be able to do the rest of the show. I'll tell you right now. If it comes out of my mouth, I'm not going to be able to control myself because I'm barely able to right now. You listen to this. I, 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 I can't take it. One on one, I'm undefeated. Never lost. This is on crack. I, I, I can't take this. Bills Mafia, welcome in to a special Sunday night edition of Buffalo Fanatics Live. My name is Steve Mathis. You can find me on Twitter at Judge Mathis, joined by my Air Raid Hour co-host, Dave Tilton. You can find him on Twitter at Tilt Money. And I'm also joined by uh, Ryan Sullivan at Sports Rock 2 on Twitter, one of the co-hosts of the 585 Report, and as well by Jake Jordan host of the Jordan Hour, a podcast that airs on Wednesday mornings, uh, an affiliate of Buffalo Fanatics. So we are here to talk free agency today, boys, because the Buffalo Bills just keep making splash after splash after splash. But before we do, uh, before we get too much into free agency, make sure you're sticking with BF this week. Uh, BF has you covered from start to finish in free agency. We got you here tonight to uh, break down the Feliciano deal. Tomorrow, the Air Raid Hour with Dave and myself will be Aaron. Then the Rico Report on Tuesday. Smoke Break on Wednesday. The Air Raid Hour again on Thursday. And Rico again on Friday. So we got you covered here at Buffalo Fanatics. All right. Let's hop right into it, gentlemen. Segment number one, John Feliciano. The Buffalo Bills are re-signing free agent guard John Feliciano, according to Matt Perino, which has since been confirmed by uh, just about everyone. The deal is for three years and $17 million. So Matt Milano, Daryl Williams, and John Feliciano are all now returning to the Buffalo Bills. Dave, let's start with you. What are your thoughts on the Feliciano deal? Um, my initial thoughts were I was glad to have him back. Uh, I mean, glad for continuity's sake, just for the sake of continu- continuity. Uh, I I will say this. I am more, I guess, glad to have him back than for for things maybe other than what he can bring to you as a starting right guard than I am for what he could actually maybe bring to us as a starting right guard. And what I mean by that is I'm glad he's back for the sake of the relationship he has with Josh Allen and how much he means to Josh Allen and kind of what he's willing to do on the field for Josh Allen and to defend him. We saw that multiple times throughout uh, the last couple seasons. We saw it especially come to a head in that Chiefs game, the AFC championship. And I'm also glad that he's back for the fact that he can be an insurance policy for Mitch Morse. So obviously this coupled with the news of Mitch Morse restructuring, um, some of those guarantees in Mitch Morse's contract being adjusted for injury, um, this move in a way you're getting kind of like one and a half players in my mind because you are getting that insurance that you need for the center position. Now, for me, it's not all... Like, it's not all roses, right? Um, I mean, I'm certainly happy Feliciano's back. I like the idea that we do have an like a, a good idea even before free agency and the draft starts as to what that starting offensive line will look like with Ford at the left guard spot and now Feliciano manning that right guard spot. However, I am, you know, you know, Steve, I'm like big into, you know, some of these interior offensive line prospects in the draft and Wyatt Davis has been a guy I've kind of had my eye on for a while. Now, this doesn't necessarily prevent you from doing and dra- drafting an interior offensive lineman early, but it does give you more flexibility, I would say, in not forcing your hand necessarily in the draft. So from that standpoint, I like it. I do think that there is there is some room for improvement for this offensive line, even with John Feliciano back in the mix. I'll say that. Yeah, I like what you said about flexibility in the draft. You know, the Creed Humphrey, uh, Wyatt Davis dream might be dead. But uh, with that comes a rebirth, and that is the rebirth of the Brevin Jordan, uh, Pat Fryermuth talk. So the tight end dream uh, is still alive. We want to thank uh, BF supporter Ryan Teal with the thing. He says, bing, coming in. That was my best Rico impression. So thank you, Ryan, so much for the super chat. Always appreciated. Jake, what are your thoughts on Mongo re-signing for, according to Track, $3 million below market value? I actually really like that, but – I agree with a lot of what Dave said. A lot of the things that he basically threw out there, I was like thinking, I'm like, yeah, that's exactly how I think about it too with the flexibility and everything. What I have written down here in my notes is I have a love-hate relationship 
with this signing because I love that we're able to bring back a guy who has this continuity on the line and pretty much bring back Josh Allen's line that was in front of him. And that's great and all. But when you're talking to people about the run game and things like that, some people point towards the interior offensive line. Some people are pointing to the running backs. It's like a whole different thing. So maybe you don't think that Mongo Feliciano is like good to bring back because you think he's pretty much, you know, okay. But I think bringing him back just for continuity sake and the fact that he did take those snaps at center when Mitch Morris was out, I think what Dave said with having one and a half players, I think it's a good signing. Definitely being under what he's valued. I think it's pretty much good to bring him back and tells that he kind of wants to be back. But I also think that we've seen the Buffalo Bills bring back guys before. And then eventually, you know, if there's somebody they think is better, they'll replace them as fast as well. Like, especially when you had guys like last season, we had Quentin Spain, we gave him a deal. And then what happened this season? You know, he's not even here anymore because we have Cody Ford over at left guard now. So, you know, I'm not going to say all the talks are dead about bringing in another interior offensive lineman, especially at 30. But I think that them signing them should say that they want to move forward with him. But it definitely doesn't rule out that they won't replace him if he doesn't live up to the standard of the contract. Yeah, that, that's a great point, too, because we haven't even seen the details of the contract. So Matt Perino came out, said three years, $17 million, but that Adam Schefter sort of low-key threw in contract up to $17 million, which means there's probably incentives, there's probably escalators. We saw Matt Milano. There's an opt-out after year two. So Matt Milano could be a low-cap hit and then maybe a higher-cap hit the year after, and then there could be an opt-out between seasons two and season three. Um, there might not be, we don't even know the guaranteed money of the contract yet. So Brandon Bean is usually a wizard with those contracts. The exact details of the, those contracts have not come out yet. So, you know, I think you're spot on and there's probably definitely a ton of outs in that contract. Uh, if, you know, John Feliciano doesn't live up to the standard the Buffalo Bills expect from this offensive line. That being said, Ryan, I think that you were mentioning, uh, you were, you were chased off of Twitter this afternoon because you have sort of an opposing viewpoint. What, what do you think of this Mongo signing? I do not want Mongo to be a starter on this offensive line in 2021, period. There is not a major drop-off between him and Ike Bakker. So if we're signing him for depth, you can second-round tender, original-round tender, Ike Bakker, and you're not going to get a huge drop-off. They're both guys that didn't give up sacks. Bodker was a 65 overall in PFF. Feliciano was a 64.6 in run-blocking. Uh, Bakker was a 72.3, Feliciano was a 72.4, and pass blocking, Bakker was a 52.5, Feliciano was a 49.4. There is not a huge drop off if you're looking for depth of that position. And Dave, you were saying it perfectly. This draft is chock full of guys that you can come plug in and probably be solid starters day one. Now, maybe I'm different in the fact that I think Cody Ford is going to be a stud on this line. With a year in this line, with a year in the right position, and a year of being healthy, he is going to be a better than successful starter on this line. He is going to live up to all the hype. And I'll gladly eat that if I'm wrong, but I don't think I'm going to be wrong on that. John Feliciano, great player, great character guy. Uh, I'm glad that he has a relationship with Josh. But like Rico said, you can't manage with your feelings. You can't be in your feelings like that with with uh with these moves, like with John Brown, right? So he's maybe he starts for other teams, but when you look at a team like the Bills, that have a bunch of players that are basically everyone on this team is above replacement level. You gotta find who you can upgrade. And I think maybe besides Dawson Knox, maybe besides Levi Wallace, he's the most upgradable player on this team. Yeah, I mean, I, I see exactly where you're coming from. And a couple of comments in the comments section. Uh, that I like because I have no problem with contract. Like it doesn't bug me. I'm not going to lose sleep over it. I think you're the same way. I don't think you're going to lose sleep over either. No. It either. But also, he was the one guy who I wouldn't have missed if he if he didn't come back. Despite the relationship he has, uh, Randy comes in and said, uh, "How many snaps did these guys uh, play together last season? Zero. If you're counting Cody Ford as your left guard, Deion Dawkins as your left tackle, and then obviously Daryl Williams, Feliciano, and." Uh, Mitch, Mitch, Mitch Morse, zero, because Cody Ford got hurt before they had a chance to put them together. 
Uh, there was another one comment that I liked, um, and it was, you know, I would have liked to improve other positions. And I think interior offensive line is a position where you you can find, like in the second, third round of the draft, you can find a player on in free agency. You can find a player. You could have found a player, I think, for half of the price that you're probably even going to be playing Feliciano this year. And you could have used some of that money you're paying Feliciano to upgrade CB2 or to go chase a tight end. So it's going to be really interesting to see what the Buffalo Bills do in free agency because if they're dead quiet, if they're dead quiet and they don't make any moves and it's Dane Jackson versus a rookie at CB2 and it's a rookie backup interior offensive lineman behind Cody Ford and not Ike Bucker, if it's Dawson Knox and a rookie and like a bargain bin free agent at tight end, if that's what we're looking at when the season starts, I think a couple of people might be like, well, did we have to re-sign Feliciano? Could we have used that money to chase Jason Verrett? Could we have used that money to chase um, you know, Xavier Rhodes or Jarrett Cook? Th- those kind of conversations could come up if uh, the Buffalo Bills don't go out on Monday, Tuesday, and shock us. And we're going to have that conversation in just a moment. Um, and, and to wrap things up, somebody said, uh, Mongo's definitely back because John Feliciano asked. Uh, don't tell John Brown that because uh, John Brown is all in his feels about what Josh Allen feels. And if, uh, you know, John Brown's probably sitting at home drinking something, if he thinks that uh, Josh Allen had, was the reason why Mongo came back, and uh, he didn't. Uh, so let's move on to, to segment number two here. Uh, but before we do, be an all-star and smash that like button, folks. Be an all-star and smash that like button. And if you ever want to jump the line, don't feel – feel afraid to hit us up with a super chat. But segment number two, our man Greg Tom set over at Cover One Buffalo. Not afraid to admit when somebody's smarter than me, and Greg is most certainly smarter than me. He came up with a bunch of options using Spot Track on how the Buffalo Bills could, uh, could free up some money to go in, out and do some more things in free agency because right now the Buffalo Bills are done. Like, they are tapped out. It's the draft class, and that's about all they could afford right now after this John Feliciano deal. But, obviously, releasing or Lee Smith retiring saves them $2.25 million. That's likely to happen. They can uh, extend Jerry Hughes, Tyler Matikiewicz, uh, add a year onto their contract so they can spread it out. Um, so they can lower the 2021 cap hit. He projects about $5 million by doing that. There's the Stefan Diggs. You can extend Stefan Diggs. You can convert some of his... Uh, 21, 21 salary to a bonus and probably save yourself $7 million. And you can restructure uh, Dion and Trey and save yourself about $12 million. So Greg came up with a way to save about $33.4 million in cap space. And you can get some pretty good players uh, with that amount of money, but you're also kicking the can down the road. Uh, you are very much kicking the can down the road because you're locking in that money in the future and you're ballooning their contracts in the future. So, um, you know, what a, which one of these moves, if any, uh, and Dave, I'll start with you, would you make uh, to free up some cap space? Well, I would, I would look at the restructures for the ones that are certainly cornerstone type players, right? So you look at the Trey Whites, the Deion Dawkins, the Stefan Diggs, those to me make some sense to do that. Um, not sure what that, why that guy smashing the dislike. I don't think he likes smash mouth. I don't think he likes smash mouth. <laughs> Oh, he's not an okay. all-star. Okay. Astro lounge. Great album. <laughs> for all. <laughs> you. Anyway, not to get too sidetracked. Um, I like the moves where it's like the cornerstone players, right? Diggs, uh, Trey white Dawkins, the ones where I'm a little iffy are like, I'm not sure if I would be so quick to kind of give Jerry Hughes an extension. I'm not so qu- sure if I'd be so quick to give, um, Tyler Matikiewicz a restructure or an extension. In fact, I would probably lean more towards, outright cutting Tyler Matikiewicz if you were going to ask my opinion on the matter to save the money. Uh, Lee Smith, I mean, obviously that's an that's an easy one. There's no dead cap. Whether or not he retires, if, you, if he doesn't retire, you can cut him and there's no dead cap associated with that. So I like what I like where Greg's head's at for most of that. I think the only ones where I'd be a little bit hesitant would be to kind of dip too dip my foot too much into the restructuring game with Hughes and Matikiewicz, but I'd be fine kind of doing that for guys like Diggs and Trey White and Dawkins, who you clearly just made big investments in and you have no plans of those guys not being part of your team over the next three to four years. Now that may hurt you a little bit in what kind of cap space you have the next couple of years, but 
we all anticipate the cap's going to be back up to kind of normal levels or if not even higher than it was in 19 in 2022, or I'm sorry, in 2020 to 2022. So I'm kind of on board with, mo with most of what Greg's got there. And even if you don't do the Jerry Hughes and uh, Matikiewicz thing, I think, I still think that puts you in a pretty good ballpark for, um, for signing a few guys plus your draft picks. So that's, that's kind of the only place where I might differ from what, uh, from what Greg laid out there. What about you, Jake? Of all of these ways to free up some cap space, which ones are looking best to you? I really think that the best ones are actually exactly what Dave said. Again, every single time Dave goes, I'm like, oh, I look down at my notes and it's the same exact thing. <laughs> it's Likewise. legitimately those cornerstone guys restructuring them. I know it's like kicking the can down the road and it's hard to get out of those contracts if you ever want to in the future. But when you're looking at these guys like, Diggs and Dawkins and Trey White. I mean, do you see them not on this team and a couple of not living out their contracts? Like, I think they'll be worth the money. And then once the cap space goes back up, you know, you're not killing yourself by doing that now. And, you know, we're in our window. I say, I literally have in my notes, I'm like, this is our window. So if we are thinking that we're a couple big moves away from being able to legit contend in these Super Bowls. I think kicking the can down the road for these cornerstone guys isn't such a bad idea at all. Yeah, no, I like that. And and the thing, too, is that only one Buffalo comes in and says, the Saints have been kicking the can down the road since 2013. So, hey, why not just start now and kick the can down the road until Josh Allen is, you know, 37 years old and he turns into Ben Roethlisberger. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, I'm totally with you. Diggs, White, and Dawkins are the three guys where you can just picture these guys on the team for the next decade. So it doesn't scare me too much to guarantee their salaries into the future. Uh, but, but Ryan, what, what about you? What are the, which one of these moves would you use to free up some cap space? You know, I, I think I agree with, with the sentiment here. And just to add some more context, Stefan Diggs right now is the 17th highest paid wide receiver in the league. He and with Schuster getting paid this year, and Corey Davis getting paid this year, it's very possible when Alan David, when, you know, it, it's very possible that he ends up the 19th highest paid receiver. Will and Fuller's also going to get paid. Will so Fuller's going to get paid. Curtis Samuel. I mean, there's a lot of guys. So it, it's Galladay very, as well, probably. It's yep, Galladay. Galladay. So it's very realistic that he ends up the 20th highest paid wide receiver, 21st highest paid wide receiver. And it's fine for now because, you know, it seems like he has his head, his head on straight with all this stuff and he's got the relationship and he's in a good place. But I mean, it's a business. These guys have agents. These guys have families. And so I think, and I know that we gave him an extension on, on when he came in on the front end of this. But I just for more, just being, being values, doing things the right way. So find if they could find a way to lower that cap hit this year, extend his, uh, uh, increase his AAV going down, the road are going down the road. I think that'd be huge from terms of a business standpoint, from a relationship standpoint. Um, and a guy like Dawkins, who's I think making 13 mil makes 14 mil a little bit longer down the road. Cam Robinson, who's a worse, much worse left tackle than Deion Dawkins is just got franchise tag for 13 million. Deion Dawkins is another guy that I don't mind increasing that pay, especially with that new Disney money coming in the next few years, you would assume, I think it's safe to assume, I don't think we're going to have another pandemic in the next three years that this cap's going to go up. <laughs> knock on some wood right now, dude. Knock yeah. on some wood right now. <laughs> and, you know, so I think it's safe, like you guys said, you know, there's not much more to add on that. It's safe to add money down the road because I think, one, when you add that money down the road, it's going to put them more in line with what the market value is going to be down the road for them. And... You know, and, and if you can add and extend and increase AAV along the way, like he's done with some of these players, it just it's more and just another selling point for for Brandon Bean because you notice that he never has this gruntled players. He never has, mm -hmm. you know, beside John Brown, who seemed to be confused with everything, but still, no one really. There's never been a contract issue. There's never been a holdout. Like he does things the right way, and I think he really values that. Yeah, no, I'm totally with you. And speaking of the Disney money, like that's not even. That's not even all of the money because the the NFL was like in a hurried pace to try to get it done before the salary cap this year was set and it just didn't happen. But Fox, Amazon, NBC, CBS, they all have to re up, and it's projected that the salary cap by 2025 could be 250 million dollars. Uh, so my guess is next year it's going to be back up into the 210, 215 range. So you're adding 30 million dollars. Like Jerry Jones was asked a question, like, 
were you trying to get that DAC deal in before all the TV money came in? And then he made some other comment, like, where are you supposed to get the money from to pay other players when you're paying three players $80 million? And he just winked and was pretty much like, yo, I'm not worried about money. I'm not worried about money at all. Because Jerry Jones is a guy who I think is in those conversations, uh, one of those prominent NFL owners, and he understands that this cap is going to be go up and up and up. And unless, knock on wood, there's another pandemic, it ain't coming down anytime soon after this year. So this year is the exception. If you want to kick the can down the road, this is as good a time as any uh, to do it. And those three players, as you guys mentioned, perfect. I don't want to extend Jerry Hughes. I want to be able to get out of that contract after this year if we can. Just because, again, as players get older, they hit a wall. If he hits that wall next year, I don't want to be stuck with any money. Uh, I, I like the idea of extending Tyler Matikiewicz and making him a core special teamer, bringing that salary down. And obviously, Lee Smith makes sense too. But let's say we're living in a world where the Buffalo Bills actually have some money to play with in free agency. Uh, who are some guys that we might be looking at here? Uh, so who are some guys that we could be spending money on? Uh, the Chargers released Casey Hayward. The Titans have released Malcolm Butler. I got a photo of Jared Cook up there. So, uh, Jake, I'll start with you, just so Dave doesn't steal your ideas here. Okay, well. <laughs> what, I, what positions I, do you think the Bills need to address, and what are some players you want? Okay, so really, I, I feel like there's a, a big sentiment that a lot of people – kind of know that cornerback two is a weakness for the Buffalo Bills. If you say it's not, you must not be paying attention. And I would think that I've done a podcast on this and done videos about it. I think quarterback two is also a weakness for the Buffalo Bills. And, you know, when I look at my names here, I've got guys like Mitchell Trubisky, who basically has been given up on. And then I got Ryan Fitzpatrick and Jacoby Brissett. I got these guys that might just be floundering around out there with these teams that are going out and, you know, trying to pick up these quarterbacks. And I'm just thinking, well, we paid Matt Barkley like $2 million to do absolutely nothing. And if Matt, if Josh Allen ever went down, pretty much the manifestation that I think of Matt Barkley is every single snap would be like that one snap against the Chargers where he just died, like <laughs> immediately was on the ground. That's exactly what I think about when I would think. Darrell Williams' worst season. play of the year. <laughs> yeah, that's That's that is the – Thing that is just in my mind when I think, oh my God, if I had to have a whole season of Matt Barkley, then I just, I have no idea what would happen. I think after two weeks, you would be looking at free agent quarterbacks of who to bring in if you're trying to save your season. So I think that when you got guys out there, like maybe somebody who's been given up on, like Mitchell Trubisky, kind of like, I, I kind of parallel him to Blake Bortles, where Blake Bortles was on that Jacksonville team. Mm-hmm. that they made it and but nobody was like Blake Bortles is the reason why they made it there so like what's Blake Bortles doing now I think he was like the third string for the Broncos or something this year like he's not getting paid anything so if you could get a young guy like Mitchell Trubisky to bring in the room or a veteran guy like Ryan Fitzpatrick and I know everybody's like oh the story I don't want Ryan Fitzpatrick I've already heard all of it on my YouTube videos and all that stuff I've heard it but to <laughs> kind of looks like Jake from Jake from you know, uh, here. <laughs> yeah, on, honestly, yeah, I'm I'm actually Jake from. You might not have seen me. I was pretty much hidden from the team, but legitimately, <laughs> Ryan Ryan Fitzpatrick. If you brought him in, you're not only upgrading your quarterback too, because Ryan Fitzpatrick has notoriously every single time he goes to a new team takes a deal around like three million dollars, and then when he balls out, the team's like, oh, we got to keep Fitzpatrick now, so let's give him more money. But if you bring Fitzpatrick in to be a backup quarterback and you've already got a guy like Josh Allen. So, you know, I've seen comments that people have been like, oh, they're going to want Fitzpatrick in after one bad game by Josh. No, no, they're not like Mm. like I, I don't see people calling for Matt Barkley when Josh Allen has a bad game. That's just not going to happen. So you would bring Ryan Fitzpatrick in to have that safety blanket and not. Because Ryan Fitzpatrick is going to win you games, right? You put Ryan Fitzpatrick on this Buffalo Bills team and you're winning games. Like you can have that confidence that he's not just going to go out there and absolutely blow it. And if you bring him into, I see that, Dave. Thank you. Let's smash those like things. So, (laughs) so if you bring Ryan Fitzpatrick in, Not only are you going to have that big brain behind Josh Allen, even though Josh Allen doesn't need mentoring, we already did that whole thing in his first season, 
you got a guy like Jake Fromm back there that maybe he could be learning some things in that quarterback room too. Like maybe he's going to be your backup quarterback that you're not paying anything mm-hmm. eventually. So if you can get Ryan Fitzpatrick in for $1 million more than you're playing, paying Matt Barkley on your bench, I don't see why you don't upgrade that quarterback two position. Yeah, it, it's certainly a possibility. So you, you like the Buffalo Bills have to ask themselves, like we're in the Super Bowl window. And, you know, remember what happened to the Philadelphia Eagles. The Philadelphia Eagles. Carson Wentz went down late in the season, and, and, and jo- uh, Nick Foles, big Nick Nick, was there to lead him to a Super Bowl victory. So, um, you know, that could be something that's on the, the GM's mind. But I also think that they probably, uh, you know, drafted a guy like Jake Fromm for a reason. They're really comfortable with Davis Webb. And I think Matt Barkley's probably coming back. But Joe Flacco and uh, Joe Flacco and Blake Bortles are two other names I like out there in the veteran free agent market. Ryan. What's another position you think the Buffalo Bills need to upgrade? Uh, say we do, we are able to free up, you know, ten, fifteen million dollars. What's another player, another position group that you would consider uh, going after? So I got two guys on my list. I'll go. I'll go defense since he just went offense, and I got Jarrell Casey. And a little bit of bias. I have always loved the way Jarrell Casey has played football. I think he's always been a guy who's fun as hell. Up and he was still a menace in that 2019 Tennessee Titans run, and he got hurt and played three games this year and got cut. I think he still got something in the tank. You know, I, I don't think his injury. I don't think his injury. I haven't heard his injury is going to be something that's that's career altering. If he's a guy who's willing to look at the market and take a one year three million dollar deal, a one year four million dollar deal, and you know, for a chance to go for a ring, I think he's a guy who can contribute. And I think he's a guy who can play next to Ed Oliver, who can be, you know, be what he was, you know, maybe not play at that level when he was going to Pro Bowls, but I think playing 40% of the snaps, 30% of the snaps, be a super solid contributor in the way that McDermott seems to always kind of make these rotational guys matter. Maybe not so much this year, but in previous years, there was always that Ryan Davis who cleans up sacks or that Jordan Phillips who cleans up sacks or... I think Jarrell Casey is a, would be a super great value signing for this defense. Wow, guys. I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you. I am I am shooketh. Shooketh, I tell you, that we are two panelists in and uh, an edge rusher, a cornerback, or a tight hey, end has not me been that, mentioned. I had Jared Cook on my list. I've got two names on my list. I got Yannick Ngakwe and Carlos Dunlap down there, but I decided to go on a tangent for quarterbacks. We got it. We got it. We got it. We got to go to Dave here, the voice of reason. What do do you got? Uh, What's a position of need? I mean, CB2, right? I mean, I think you look at where the value maybe uh, exists in free agency right now. Um, Addison's going to be back by all accounts. It looks like they did restructure. So, a guy that you thought may have been a cut candidate is going to be back in the mix. So potentially the bills aren't necessarily going to go hunting some more in free agency for edge, but we know they're interested in improving that position by the fact that they did try, they were in on JJ Watt. They seem to be in on Danico Autry. So it just because Addison's back in the mix doesn't mean that they're going to shy away from going after an edge player. I mean, Vinny Curry's a, a veteran I like to bring in as like a, a, a cheap option. Um, obviously, the dream scenario would be, be to bring in like a Trey Hendrickson, but we're talking about guys that maybe we can bring in realistically at this point. He's probably not. Um, but Vinny Curry is a guy that you could bring in possibly. But CB2, right? That's the, that's the position I kind of keep coming back to and looking at like where are we really lacking the depth. And there are some guys I like in the free agent market that I do think we could realistically sign – uh, to CB2, um, and again, wouldn't necessarily prevent us from taking a cornerback early in the draft, and that's Xavier Rhodes uh, and Troy Hill. Um, Xavier Rhodes coming off a, a year where he, uh, you know, he was on a one-year kind of prove it, if you will, deal. I mean, he's been a, he's a veteran, but he had his struggles in, at the end of his uh, time there in Minnesota. Um, but he graded out as PFF's ninth best cornerback last year with the Colts on a on a two million dollar deal. So he's probably played his way into a, a slightly bigger deal, uh, one, you know, one, maybe two year deal, but um, Xavier Rhodes would be a guy I would love to have come in and kind of be that sort of Josh Norman of this season to, you know, the Josh Norman Levi Wallace competition of last year. And let's not forget that Levi Wallace hasn't been tendered yet. So 
you're looking pretty thin there at the CB2 position um, with Levi Wallace not being tendered and Dane Jackson kind of being that penciled in guy right now, who I know being is high on based on his comments, but you really need to have three guys, I think, for that boundary um, corner position. You obviously have Trey, you have Dane there, but I, we really need to add a third guy there. Um, and I think that Xavier Rhodes would be kind of my top choice. And I also like Troy Hill, who's 30, coming off a really good season with the Rams. Um, probably be cheaper than cheaper than Xavier Rhodes. He was PFF's 27th best corner, but he makes splashy plays. He made he scored, uh, I think, two defensive touchdowns last year. Um, the Rams were a very good defense last year. He played opposite of Jalen Ramsey. So he's obviously used to playing sort of opposite of a true alpha CB1. Um, so we've, you know, CB, CB2, like uh, like Ryan was saying earlier, really needs to be addressed. So I like Rhodes or uh, Troy Hill as options. Yeah, I like that. We had Dave Dave Kane come in and says, with $33 million in cap, we would be dumb not to bolster the defense. So we went through Greg's we went through Greg's tweet and talked about how we could realistically free up $33 million, but the Buffalo Bills haven't done that yet. Right now, the Buffalo Bills are setting, sitting at practically their draft class. These are mm -hmm. realistic moves the Buffalo Bills could make, but they haven't made any of them. My guess is they're going to go and they're going to contact guys in free agency they like, and if they find a guy that they like, They'll sign them to a contract, and then they'll approach either Trey White or uh, you know Jerry Hughes or Stephon Diggs or uh, Deion Dawkins and make that corresponding move to level out the cap. So it's not like we have $33 million to play with. We possibly have uh, $33 million or to play with, play with, but we're pushing. We're kicking a lot of cans down the road if we uh, make all of those moves. R uh, Ryan, who are some other corners that you might be interested in to come in and compete with Dane Jackson for CB2? I like Malcolm Butler. I think if if we have the money there, he's a guy that I really enjoy to who could come in and he's experienced and he could be a he's played in big games and I think he's a guy if you draft a rookie, if you decide to go with Dane, whatever it is, can be that mentor, be that guy who's, you know, maybe a little bit younger than Norman who isn't quite on the back end of his career. Um so he's the he's the one and I think I think I really like Casey Hayward too. I and I I think that's a really good comment because I was talking about that on Twitter today. That I'm not totally sold on Dane Jackson, and I'm not sold on the fact that Brandon Bean is necessarily sold on Dane Jackson. Dane or uh, Brandon Bean has said stuff in the past that he hyped up T.J. Yeldon at the combine last year, saying that he trusts T.J. Yeldon to be a TV or uh, art running back too, and all this stuff. So I'm I mean this this is down the road, but I'm I'm more of a cornerback in the draft guy and we can talk about that later but if i'm looking at i think my guy that i have circled more than anyone is malcolm butler because i think he's probably got the most of his take and if i'm going second i have no idea what his deal is going to be this year because of because of no one knows what any of the, all the contract values are all askew this year with the cap and everything but i think casey hayward could be a guy that wants that one year mercenary deal to get paid in 2022 so if you you know if you want to go to a team that's going to give you a chance to compete, that's going to be the Bills. And I think as more of these guys get cut, as more of these guys hit the market, I really want to skim the surface for those veterans looking for that one more payday. And I think guys like Casey Hayward and guys like Malcolm Butler may be right in that sweet spot for the Bills. Yeah, we got David Kane coming in saying he would like Malcolm Butler because he was basically CB one uh, in. Uh, uh, in ten Tennessee, there, Jake. Any cornerbacks left on your list? And then, I had know. Casey Hayward, but I just uh, for context, when Bean was talking about Dane Jackson, wasn't that also on a podcast with Richard Sherman? Was also yes, there. it was. Yes, it was. So I don't, I don't think you want to talk bad about your cornerback too that everybody's looking at when a free agent corner is also sitting there. You don't want to look desperate to where it's going to be like. <laughs> Okay, Please, he has Richard. leverage, but I, I I love Dane Jackson in depth. I I watched Dane Jackson absolutely end UCF's uh, undefeated streak with a pick, uh, and then when he got picked by the Bills, I was like, ah, I know that guy. Maybe not for the best reasons, but he <laughs> he definitely he's a playmaker. He's a dog, and definitely being one of those later draft pick guys, you know, he's gonna have a little bit of fire under him. But yeah, I got Casey Hayward because. Man, this guy got drafted the year after the Green Bay Packers won a Super Bowl and has not been back in his whole career. Casey Hayward has not had a chance. And for, for my thing, I got ring chasing free agents. And I've got him on there because he's probably like, 
I, I don't have much longer as a chance to get a ring. And for a team like Buffalo, if they want to bolster their cornerback room, a guy like Casey Hayward, who's been around and has that veteran experience, I think if he wants to come in on that deal and start chasing for a ring at this stage of his career, I think that's a good addition to bring into any cornerback room. How about tight ends? You got any tight ends on your list? Tight ends on my list, I do not. Not past, you know, your your normal like John U. Smiths and things like that. But Can right now I got to wait. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta wait. I gotta wait to see for Lee Smith to actually retire, and see what the Buffalo Bills, who they're reaching out to, and things like that. But I, I mean, I love John U. Smith. I like Kyle Rudolph as well as guys like that that are veterans that could come in and make an impact. But you know, just for like straight facts about the tight ends, I don't got nobody. All right, Ryan, sell us on Jared Cook. I don't want to spend a ton of money on this. I'm still in the camp that I think Dawson Knox can develop. I don't think he's I don't think he's uh ready to be thrown away yet, but I think he could benefit from a veteran. And Lee Smith's great. Lee Smith's a great leadership guy, but he he's basically a left tackle that can catch at this point or when he was playing. Give me a guy who has experience pass catching, who's athletic, who can inline block. Yeah, he has some he also has some catch issues, but he's a guy who's probably looking for a ring. He's a guy who's going to come on the cheap and can be just another mentor to Dawson Knox and take some of that off his plate. I've talked about it all off season. You let Dawson Knox be that tight end two, kind of that halfback or that halfback out of the backfield kind of guy. Let him do some of those different things and take some of the stuff that are on his plate as a tight end one and let him give him a different role in that playbook. And I think this offense is vastly different. And Jared Cook still put up, seven, I think, 700 yards or 500 yards last year. He still was still a productive tight end last year. So if he's willing to come here in a cheap deal, whether it's vet men, whether it's $2 million, $3 million, Jared Cook, I think, is would be the perfect sweet spot for the Bills at tight end. Bobby wants to bring wow, back wow, uh, Charles Clay. Wow, I don't know Bobby. about that, but don't uh, play like that. You know, I here's what I like about Jared Cook is last season, early on in the season, Gabe Davis was used in that big slot type of role. Gabe Davis did most of his work from the slot, and that's when he was most effective. When he had to go out and he had to play the John Braun role on the outside, he had no more than three receptions in those games that John Brown missed. So my expectation is Gabe Davis is going to move to the boundary and take John Brown's role next year. And I think he will excel, and I think he will do well. Um, he's got an offseason to change. He's got an offseason to, to learn that position, a training camp, all of those good things. So I think Gabe Davis is going to be fine out there on the boundary. But that big slot role now has to be filled. And a lot of people assume it'll be Isaiah Hodgins, and that's all good and great. But what happens if Isaiah Hodgins isn't good? I mean, the guy was a six-round pick. So as much as I love Isaiah Hodgins, what if he's not good? A guy like Jared Cook is a guy you could split out wide, like a big slot wide receiver, and he can fill that Gabe Davis role from last year while Gabe Davis slides into that John Brown role. So that's why I'm all in on Jared Cook. But, Dave, tell the people about my man Gerald Everett because I wouldn't mind Gerald Everett either. Yeah, I mean, Gerald, Gerald Everett last couple of years has been kind of in a platoon situation with Tyler Higby and the Rams. And, um, you know, the Rams, they – you know, they don't run a lot of two tight end sets out there. We know they're primarily in their uh, uh, in their um, 11 personnel out there, and they're three wide, one tight end, one running back. And, you know, there was a time there where Gerald Everett looked like maybe he was going to be the guy. And then, you know, over the last year and a half or so, it's really been Tyler Higby that stepped up and kind of been that guy. So it kind of left Gerald Everett on the outs. The Rams are obviously aren't going to – resign him with the cap situation they're in now with Stafford and other guys that they have under contract. So Gerald Everett is a guy that kind of projects as a, as an all around tight end. He can block, he's athletic. Um, he's flashed in, in spots with the Rams and he's likely to be in that tier below the Hunter Henry, John U. Smith's of the world. And if you can get him on a decent contract, then I wouldn't mind I wouldn't mind them going after a Gerald Everett. Now I will say this now that we've made some of these other signings, I'm kind of cooled on big money tight end uh, as a, as something to target. But if we were going to go for sort of that middle tier tight end, like if you're talking about like a Kyle Rudolph sort of Gerald Everett type level tight end, and you can get Gerald Everett in the neighborhood of 
it's probably not going to happen. But if you could get him in the neighborhood of, a, you know, $5 million, I know that's a stretch. He's probably going to get a little more than that, but then I would consider it. Now, the issue I have right now with the tight end room is what is Dawson Knox going to be to you? With you, with you bring in a Jared, Jared Cook, like you guys are saying, it's clear he's coming in to mentor and he's coming in to be like a seam guy. He's not coming in to kind of be the take take over to be the tight end one necessarily for the long term. So in, in my mind, you either go one extreme or the other. You go to the Jared Cook route for like the field stretching kind of seam tight end who's more of a receiving guy, or you go the complete opposite route and you go for a pure inline blocker like an Eric Tomlinson and then Dawson Knox is still kind of your main main receiving threat, and the Tomlinson would obviously replace Lee Smith's role. So um, with all that said, Gerald Everett gives you a little bit of everything. If you sign him, he would clearly be your TE1, and then that sort of would probably mean you're not going after tight end early in the draft, most likely. Yeah, we got Dylan coming in saying, Jared Cook has some serious ball security issues. Devil's advocate. Maybe people will get off Dawson Knox's back about his fumbles if we bring in somebody worse. <laughs> uh but uh but but other than that let's let's talk now wide receiver because somebody else said why do we assume gabe davis is going to be john brown's replacement well because gabe davis is probably going to need more snaps uh, because it's probably the logical next step for gabe davis to turn into that boundary receiver because we already have cole beasley in the slot uh, a bunch of different things because gabe davis becomes a more valuable receiver to you if he can develop as an outside guy, but say the Buffalo Bills are still in the market for another receiver, which I hope they are, because um, I who, there's no guarantee Isaiah McKenzie's going back, no no guarantee Andre Roberts coming back. There's a severe lack of speed. My guy right now is Djax. I want to bring Djax out here to be a limited traitsy uh, role player on this team, a guy who can play on the boundary, a guy who can do the jet sweep stuff, and a guy who can return punts. I'm all on the Djax, Deshaun Jackson bandwagon, but uh, Jake. Do you have any wide receivers you'd like to see the Buffalo Bills go out and uh, pursue in the free agent market? Wide receivers? Uh, I really do believe in the progression of Gabe Davis. Uh, I'm one of the biggest Gabe Davis advocates. And uh, when, when it comes to wide receivers, I really think it's just bolstering up the depth. I don't think you're really trying to get somebody and bring them in that's going to replace John Brown because you want to keep it in-house and just – get somebody there maybe bring back your isaiah mckenzie's if you're able to and maybe you let your andre roberts walk and keep it young and you know just keep building guys through your system that to where eventually who knows maybe when cole beasley you know eventually god forbid is gone then we will have maybe isaiah hodgins behind him i really do believe in the bringing these guys if we're going to bring these guys in, they need to make a significant impact. I don't want to just bring in a wide receiver just for the hell of it. I think that it's really important to develop your guys in-house. And I think the logical next step is to just let Gabe Davis kind of try to mature into that that wide receiver two role across from Stefan Diggs, which we can hope can be the thing for years to come and then build somebody behind Cole Beasley and then kind of, you know, bring in these guys like your Kenny Stills, like we did that kind of are just there for assurance and then have your main special teams punt returner guy that can also contribute to the wide receiver room, which is one of my big reasons why I'm more of an advocate of bringing uh, Isaiah McKenzie back instead of Andre Roberts, because I feel like he offers more to the wide receiver room than Andre Roberts does. But, no, I don't have any big names for bringing in wide receivers in free agency. I really do think that the Buffalo Bills might kind of just keep it in-house and get some guys that maybe are just floating around out there to bolster up some space. Yeah, great, great point on Isaiah McKenzie, too, because of that versatility. You know, John Waro uh, tweeted today that, hey, the rate the Buffalo Bills are going, maybe they can re-sign Isaiah McKenzie. Mm -hmm. And if John Waro is tweeting that, it means it's probably not going to happen. So let's talk about Cordell Patterson. Uh, Cordell Patterson is a guy who can play a little bit of running back, do that jet sweep stuff, give you an ability as a slot receiver and on kick and punt returns. Uh, I want your thoughts, uh, Ryan, on Cordell Patterson and any other receivers you might be interested in. Uh, yeah, Cordell Patterson would be great because I think he combines Isaiah McKenzie and he combines um, Andre Roberts. And I think that's what this team is missing, as great as Andre Roberts is, as improved as Isaiah McKenzie has been. It's been frustrating that they can't be the same person. It's been inefficient that they can't be the same person. So if Cordell Patterson can be 
a guy that wants to come in on a cheap deal to a team that compete. I'm all about it. You can do a lot of funky things with him. I think Dable would have a field day sketching up things in the offense for him. You know, I think Dable this year is going to be kind of on a revenge tour. I'm excited to see what kind of stuff comes out of his playbook this year. So if he's a guy who wants to come in cheap, I'm all about Cordero Patterson. My guy that I have on my list since he's been cut is Emmanuel Sanders. I think he is the perfect addition to this receiving room as a veteran. You know, this is an offense that runs 10 personnel more than anyone that runs 11 personnel. You need four to five wide receivers with complementary skill sets. I love what Gabe Davis did this year. Gabe Davis is not the same receiver as John Brown. He does not have the route tree that John Brown has. You know, he can do, they do different things. And that's not a knock on Gabe Davis. They're just different receivers. And I want someone who can come in and play that John Brown role. And when you draft wide receivers, it can be kind of a crapshoot at times. Emmanuel Sanders has, was productive last year in New Orleans. He, he's, old, he's getting up there in age. He's 33, but he was productive last year. He's a guy who I think probably, if he's coming back somewhere, wants to go somewhere to compete. He won a Super Bowl when I was a sophomore in high school, and he hasn't been back since. He's, I think he's still got his speed. I think he's still got his athleticism. And I think he's still got plenty in the tank. I'm not sold. You know, I the Isaiah McKenzie stands are strong, but I'm not I'm not super sold on paying Isaiah McKenzie. You know, he's been great. He's been fun. It's been fun to watch return, but I think someone's going to pay him more than what he's probably worth. And I think Emmanuel Sanders is a perfect veteran to add to this wide receiver group and this offense that's so unique in the formations that they run. I think that's a great point. Steve Rose comes in in the uh, Andre Roberts, Isaiah McKenzie debate. And he says, Hey, Roberts was a pro bowl level returner. McKenzie was a fourth receiver. I'd take Roberts any day. I think the biggest issue people have with Andre Roberts is his lack of versatility. So my question to you, Dave, is this, is Andre Roberts not versatile or has Andre Roberts not been given a chance to show his versatility because guys ahead of him were better. And now that there are open spots on the depth chart and some skill sets that are going to be going bye-bye in John Brown and Isaiah McKenzie, can Andre Roberts fill any of these roles as well as contributing as a kick and punt returner? I mean, he can, and especially if you're getting going to get him on the cheap. I mean, look, you look at Andre Roberts' career stats, he, he does have 261 career receptions uh, and over 3,000 career receiving yards. And um, he's put together some decent seasons like early in his career with the Cardinals. He had a 51 catch season. He has 64 catch season. Now he hasn't had anything over 14 catches in five years, but he pretty much kind of settled into that return man type role. Um, but he had spent time in his career being a receiver. You know, when he was with the Cardinals, he was kind of like their third receiver at that time. This is like the pre John Brown days, right? When they still had Larry Fitzgerald and, um, and he was kind of like that that third guy. So if you're expecting him to be like a third or fourth guy, I still am not so sure about that. But I think that I would rather – I for me personally, the way he's kind of excelled on the, in the return game, I would personally rather him only focus on that if we were going to bring him back. I wouldn't want him to kind of put that extra stress on himself or have that extra added pressure on kind of having to contribute – also as a receiver when I would rather his focus kind of be purely in the return game. People know, like I, I want a versatile guy, right? Like the names Will Fuller and Corey Davis have been thrown around as like guys to go after, but those guys don't help you really in the, in special, in the return game. So, you know, I put the, I put the meme out there the other day of like the guy, like looking back at John Brown and then like looking at a uh, Curtis Samuel. And that was before John Brown was even cut. And look, I'd love to go after a Curtis Samuel. He can help you kick return kicks. He can play on the outside. He can play on the inside. And honestly, it and it, running back and, and he plays out of the backfield. And as a long-term option, he could be a slot receiver for you in the post Cole Beasley era if you really wanted to look that far ahead you got two years left on Cole Beasley's contract Curtis Samuel can play out of the slot if you give Curtis Samuel a four-year deal you can have him play play the John Brown role this year you can have him play out of the backfield a little bit you can have him return kicks and then who knows in two years time you can have him be your slot guy we're probably not going to go after him just because of the money but like that's the kind of Swiss Army knife type of guy who play inside out can help you in return game can help you out of the backfield who I'd love to go after 
um, as a known commodity, right? As opposed to kind of maybe having to go into the draft to try to find that guy. Now, obviously, the draft's a cheaper option, and you potentially can get, you know, get someone like that in the draft to contribute. But um, I guess to answer your main question around the Andre Roberts thing, like I'd rather him just work, just do returns. Like I don't, I, I know he's got a decent amount of career receptions and 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 yards like early in his career, but I just don't think that's his game anymore. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm with you. I think he's shown flashes in training camp, but somebody mentioned that Tennessee interception and and all those different things. Randy Harmon coming in with a great comment. Why spend money on your fourth, fifth, sixth wide receivers? Draft their replacements. That's Bean's job. Uh, fourth touche, receiver, Randy. though, in this fourth receiver in this offense, it's important, is important though. Mm-hmm. So, so like, oh, hey, like they, Ryan, they, Ryan mentioned, we ran more ten personnel than any other team in the league, uh, percentage wise, and we ran more eleven personnel plays than anyone. It wasn't highest mm-hmm. percentage wise, but more per- eleven personnel plays than any team. So. That fourth receiver is important. Look what happened this past year when John Brown got injured. Gabriel Davis steps in. We kind of don't miss a beat. If you go into the season with really only three kind of core guys and one of those guys gets hurt, what are you? Where is that guy coming from? Is it Isaiah? Is it Isaiah Hodgins? Who is it? So I really think I I don't disagree with any of the fifth sixth guy, but I do think the fourth guy yeah. means something here to this team. Hey, we met with Rondale Moore. So if the Buffalo Bills want to go the draft route for their uh, fourth wide receiver. I would like it to be Rondale Moore. I would like it to be like Deami Brown. Somebody I know has that inside outside flex uh, and can do a ton of different things. But Bobby coming in saying, give me Felton or give me death. I got no problems with Felton as wide receiver five, but I think I struggle with it as wide receiver four Um, because, you know, we got good contributions from Gabe Davis last year, but John Brown was also there as a veteran presence and then got hurt. Gabe Davis is only going into year two. Uh, so it's not like we are as experienced as we used to be back there. Uh, last position group here that I want to talk about is edge rusher. We have Jerry Hughes coming back. We have Mario Addison restructuring will likely be back. You have AJ Epinesa. You have Daryl Johnson. You have Mike Love, and you have Brian Cox. Jake, do you think there's room for another edge rusher on this team, especially in free agency? I do. And I think that all has to do with what is actually going to happen with these restructures. Are restructures the thing that are going to happen? Or are we 100% just thinking of building through the draft or not really pursuing anybody? Because like I said, I've got guys like Yannick and Gakwe who I think if you think back to last offseason when everybody was thinking about, oh, who are the Bills going to get on the edge? You know, one of the names that was being thrown around was Yannick Ngakwe. And everybody's like, oh, well, he's going to get tagged by the Jaguars. And he did get tagged by the Jaguars, but then he was traded. And then he went to the Vikings. And then he got traded again. And then he got put uh, literally in the same year, traded to the Ravens and is now a free agent. And I think that Yannick Ngakwe, if you're trying to get somebody who's young and has a little bit of experience and proven behind it, I. I look at Yannick Ngakwe and I think, okay, I can plug him in where we we got the pay cut for Mario Addison, right? But that doesn't take him out of the doghouse that the Buffalo Bills were still looking for somebody to throw over there and possibly replace him. So I don't think that if Yannick Ngakwe is kind of just like, yeah, I've missed out on having a Super Bowl when I was on the Saxonville Jaguars. And, you know, maybe I'm going to take this one – maybe one year deal or maybe the Buffalo Bills want to lock him up and be like, we think this guy is a young enough stud that we'll throw him over there. And then eventually when we get Jerry Hughes's old butt out of Buffalo, that we're going to have probably AJ Epinesa on the other side of that. So hey, respect Jerry. He will come after you. Oh no, I know. I'm, I'm waiting <laughs> Jerry Hughes to bust through my door right now. <laughs> It's like those commercials, uh, Terry Tate off his line. Yeah. Here. He's gonna bust he only door. gets paid if he makes the tackle. Ryan, how about you? Do you think there's room to, to add a defensive end or an edge rusher to this football team in free agency? So shameless plug, if you listen to our podcast, the 585 Report, you know that I was very much team Carl Lawson. I think guys like that are now priced out of our range. So the guys I look at now are 
two guys and like yeah i think i think price tag wise we're out on Kara loss and i love him i think someone's gonna be really happy to get him but i think buffalo's got to be out on him at this point so guys i look at are guys that have either been kind of buried where they are because of the line they've been on or guys that have had success and for one reason of number one reason or another have kind of fallen off so some names that i have circled Tyus Bad or Ty, Tyus Battle, the Syracuse basketball player. Tyus Bowser. <laughs> Tyus Syracuse got into the tournament today. That's why I was thinking about them. Uh, Tyus Bowser, I think a guy who's kind of been buried in Baltimore. You know, he's had s- some efficiency when he's played. I think a guy who maybe you up his snaps, finds a little bit more success, can get him on the cheap. I think a guy like Morgan Fox, I know Zach in the comments said Morgan Fox, a guy who was kind of buried in in L.A. who can come in, come in cheap, find some more success. One guy that I'm really, I'd be interested in is uh, Ezekiel Anza. I didn't even realize he was a free agent this year. He got hurt this year. He's a guy who's had 12 sacks before in his career. He's 32 or 33, so he's getting up there. I know Bill's Mafia is kind of over the old pass rush, uh, the old edge rusher. But you know, people come in sometimes and they get that second, they get that second life for a year or two years. So I'm, I want to find someone, and there's other names out there, but find me someone who's either a buried on a death chart somewhere on a good line, or b someone who's put out numbers before and maybe is looking for one more, has one more juicier one more year one more year of juice in them one more year of production in them and see if you can get them in on the cheap yeah no i I, i'm in you know what i see a lot of names being tossed about in the comment section morgan fox we met with nico autry um you know terrell basham uh vic beasley i saw a ton of names but but here's here's where my thought process is i think the nico autry that that conversation was uh, probably a conversation that was going on or an interest that was going on if a guy like uh, Mario Addison wasn't willing to restructure. Because if you look at the edge, you have the two older guys in Addison and Hughes, then you have the younger guys in Daryl Johnson and AJ Epinesa. If I'm the Buffalo Bills, I'm probably looking for a younger guy and a guy who can someday take the mantle from Jerry Hughes. And there are two guys in the draft the Buffalo Bills have shown interest in. They met with Tro Chion from Washington, and uh, Dan Morgan was honed in on Joseph uh, Asai at the Texas Pro Day. So those are two guys that the Buffalo Bills can get in the uh, second round of the draft possibly can slip to them at 60, who they can draft and they can add to this defensive line. I would be shocked, shocked, if we added another veteran to this defensive line just because it's just it's just so full of uh, those uh, those veteran type of guys. So for me, I personally want to instill some youth. All right, let's jump to the next segment. But before we do, again, be a BF All-Star and smash that like button. All right, smash that like button for us, folks. We got 250 people in here. And last I checked, we only had about 80 likes. It helps us out. So if you could please, uh, you know, smash that like button, it would be super appreciated. But next segment, ladies and gents, there was a tweet from Field Yates. The Bills now have 19 of their 22 starters from the AFC Championship game under contract for at least the 2021 season. Two others, Ike Butker and Levi Wallace and Corey Borges, he forgot Corey Borges, are restricted free agents and could well return. One of the NFL's best rosters stays intact. And I think if you look over this roster, with well, we're going to keep Corey Borges out of it because like at this point in free agency, who gives a shit about the punter? But... <laughs> If you look at this roster, like people are going to have issues with backup quarterback. People are going to have issues with running back. People are going to have issues with depth at receiver. People are going to have issues with depth on the defensive line. People are going to have issues with uh, depth at linebacker or safety. But if you if you really, really hone it in, left guard where Cody Ford is and CB2 where Dane Jackson are currently slotted are the two big question marks on the Buffalo Bills roster. So my question to you guys, and Dave, I'll start with you. How comfortable would you be if in week one of the 2021 season, Dane Jackson is your starting CB2 and or Cody Ford is your starting uh, left guard? Well, I'd be, if you're going to ask me to kind of weight them, I'd be more comfortable. I'd be more comfortable with Cody Ford as a starting left guard 
uh, versus Dane Jackson as Dane Jackson as the starting CB2. Uh, and the reason I say that is because the investment you made in Cody Ford by trading up, albeit it was two spots a couple of years ago to get him, seemed like he was maybe um, – uh, sorry, what was that comment that came up? Was oh, no, correct? sorry. I was just putting it up. You oh, didn't have to read okay. it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, and so I feel like the the, re- the way the rest of the line kind of is now sh- taking shape with Feliciano back and everyone else back, I feel okay, honestly, with Cody Ford being in there at starting at left guard. And whether or not, like, Butker's back, I think it's kind of it kind of doesn't matter to me. Like, I mean, yes, it would be great to have Butker back as that swing guy, but, like, you have Bates, you have other guys that potentially could kind of be the backup guard. CB2, if Dane Jackson starting at CB2, it means that you either, one, didn't invest high draft capital on a corner, and two, didn't go out and get a Xavier Rhodes or a, or a Troy Smith or a Jason Verrett or someone like that. Because if you did, those got, one of those guys is likely starting over Dane Jackson. Now, you could have a situation where you sign or draft a guy early like a melon fan or someone like that and maybe they don't necessarily start the season as cb2 but eventually take it over from dane jackson so i guess what i'm saying is i'm putting together kind of like the the um moves that probably were or in this case were not made as to gauge my comfort level. So if Dane Jackson's sitting out there week one as your CB2, it likely means you didn't put a ton of uh, investment, whether it's through draft capital or free agency in that CB2 spot. Whereas for Cody Ford, I I fully expect that he's going to be given every chance to start because of the draft capital they did invest in him a couple years back and the just general lack of, um, you know, the lack of position depth behind him. So I think that's where I come out with this Ford versus versus Jackson debate. Jake, how about you? How do you come out on Ford and Jackson? If they're starting week one next year, what's your comfort level? I am comfortable with Ford at left guard. I think that for some reason, the Buffalo Bills like to keep Ike Butker around. So I think for some reason, he's still going to be on the Buffalo Bills next season. Probably sitting behind Cody Ford, just in case something happens. At cornerback two, Dane Jackson, Opposed to what I said earlier that I think Dane Jackson is a dog and he's a guy who's going to go out there with fire under him. If he is your cornerback too, you better have some depth. Like your depth behind him, like Dave said, like if they're not beating out this late round draft pick, Dane Jackson better be a stud out there in camp Mm -hmm. or like you need, he needs to be, he's a depth guy. I mean, from what we've seen, he's kind of a depth guy. I mean, he didn't, he didn't really beat out Levi Wallace. Levi Wallace was out with the foot injuries and stuff like that. And it was more of a competition between Levi Wallace and Josh Norman other than having Dane Jackson. So if Dane Jackson is your starting corner too, I'm either expecting that he better have won that competition in camp. If that does occur this year, or mate, or we just didn't try at all because there are names out there on that free agent market that I think that you should bring in to have that competition there and are most likely going to be better than Dane Jackson or Dane Jackson's going to come out and prove what a lot of a lot of some people, certain groups at Bills Mafia believe that Dane Jackson is going to be one of those guys in the next stud that just comes out from a late round draft pick. I got another question for you, Jake, because I know you have some feelings about this man. Because for those of you who don't know, Jake is a UCF alum. So uh, by chance is a big fan of of uh, Aaron Robinson. You don't you don't like Aaron Robinson, do you? Tell the people about Aaron, Aaron Robinson. Do I have to? Yes, you have to. <laughs> okay, so if you watched UCF's defense at all this year, which uh, most likely none of you did, um, But if you did, Aaron Robinson was for some reason thrown into a mock draft that the Bills would take him at 30. I do not think that he is worth a first-round pick, nor do I think he's a second-round pick. He has some attributes there to where I think he could, uh, with some learning in the NFL, turn into something. But he's not really a guy that I think is going to come in and make an impact, especially a first-round pick impact. And, you know, I I watched him get burnt plenty of times this year and when i see somebody getting burnt like toast 
you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to eat that piece of toast. So when I saw it <laughs> for this many years, you know, I, I think that if you got him late, Aaron Robinson, yeah, sure, he could turn into something. But, you know, if if anybody's trying to throw out that we should take him at 30, I mean, they're ridiculous. Jake, should Jake let, me tell you, let me tell you who that guy was for me. And this guy okay. has been awful in the NFL. And that was, uh, for my school, that was David Emerson from NC State, the corner. You remember okay. how badly this guy got burned with Oakland, like on the Raiders? Like, he, this guy was so terrible. And then I think he went to Washington or something after that. But... That was the guy that was from NC State that people loved as like a corner. And the dude just got roasted in college. And the reason he got picked high is because he had a lot of interceptions. And it's because mm. everyone threw at him every freaking game. Yeah. And they just disregarded how many times the dude got burnt because he had nice interception totals. So David Emerson might be my equivalent to your Aaron Robinson <laughs> this year. If if you really want somebody from that secondary from UCF, it's Richie Grant. And I think that a lot of people have said that you can look at draft boards. Richie Grant is a really good safety. And I would think out of the one thing that was good on that UCF or UCF defense last year, it was Richie Grant at safety. There's a there's yeah. a corner too. Who's the other corner there? He's been getting some hype lately. PFF loves him. I bet they do. What who is the who is that other corner? Um let me get his name real quick. He's he's going really late in the TDN mocks uh, in the simulator and stuff, but he is getting a lot of love from PFF, who's saying he's super under the radar. And that name is um I'm I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. He oh he's way down on the rankings here for uh, Tegawan. Oh, Tegawan, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, okay, are so are looking at him. Oh, are they? Yeah, yeah. Well, Who's they're expecting probably the, the, Ram, the, the Rams, Rams met with him, I believe. Mm. I think obviously they're going to lose Troy Hill. So I mean, I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but um, I know that they're meeting with him. I believe. Again, there wasn't much to really say about that UCF secondary this year. I mean, if you watched games where, you know, I'm, I'm going to say Aaron Robinson was the cornerback one, so he was getting thrown at a lot, like Dave mm. said with his example. He was getting thrown at a lot. But Ty Gawan, he's he's decent in coverage, but my dude kind of reminds me a little bit more of what we have in Dane Jackson, where he's kind of like zone and goes in and out, but he's not going to be your guy that if you're wanting him to bump and stay with somebody, I mean, Ty Gawan... I mean, maybe you should pick him up in the sixth or seventh round, but he's. And I guess he opted out in 2020. He hasn't played yeah. since 2019, so that's also something hmm. to consider. But I, I think that's going to hurt a lot of people. Do you think that's going to hurt a lot of people's draft stock this year? These guys that have opted out. Oh yeah, it's going to be. They're going to be yeah. all over the board. Mm. I hopefully think that gets hurt. Hopefully it'll it gets hurt Walker Little. <laughs> yeah, it'll hurt some, and it might help some as far as like the Bills getting like mm. gems where they might not have otherwise been able to. Oh yeah, dude, I think there's going to be a ton of guys that go late in this draft where people are like, "Oh my god, how'd they fall that much?" Like it's like because people decided they wanted somebody who played last year. Over now that a group thing too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Ryan, I want to throw a curveball at you here, so okay. I'm going to move away from the Cody Ford, Dane Jackson discussion. So I apologize if you have a response already. But I want to throw you a curveball here because Chris Spencer said something in the comment section that blew my damn mind. He said, John Feliciano's our left guard. I'm sitting here when we signed him. My thoughts are he's the right guard. Cody Ford's the left guard. It's over. Our offensive line is set in stone. But Chris Spencer over here is saying they're going to play him at left guard. And that has me thinking maybe the Buffalo Bills still could be pursuing a right guard. Do you think there's a chance John Feliciano is our left guard and the Buffalo Bills are still in the market for another? I don't think they're moving on from Cody Ford. So I don't think any, I don't think there's a scenario next year where Cody Ford is not a starter at guard period. Whether he plays right guard, whether he plays left guard, I don't think that particularly matters. I think one thing that I know I'm super interested in, and I brought in a bunch of times, I tweeted it out this weekend. I want to bring in a guy who can maybe take Morse's spot. When Eric Wood came in as a rookie in that in the same year that I think we drafted Aaron Maben too, 
Um, he played guard next to Jeff Hangardner, who was an experienced center, who was a good center, a sturdy veteran. I want to go out. I would love to go out and get a Creed Humphreys. I would love to go out and get, I think it's Trey Smith. Randy Hartman commented on my, one of my Twitter posts this weekend. I want to go out and get, oh, I forgot his name. There's like, I think there's a guy from Texas or Texas Tech who's a Jack center Anderson. guard. Jack Anderson. Jack Anderson. And get me a guy, whether it's taking Feliciano's job, whether it's sitting on the bench for a couple years, find me someone there with positional versatility that can play next to under Mitch Morris. And that's where I, that's where I'm at with this because Mitch Morris can get out pretty cheaply in 2022. So for me, I don't think, I think you got, I mean, you got to ride it out with Ford this year, right? You have to, you have to see what it is he has. And I, I'm telling you, you can come find me on Twitter. You can rub it in my face. If I'm wrong at the end of the year, Cody Ford is going to be a stud, write it down in pen, write it down in ink. Cody Ford is going to be ball out. People are going to go crazy. He's going to go to a pro bowl. John, uh, excuse me, Cody Ford is a stud. So whatever happens next year, it's going to be with Cody Ford at guard. Whatever happens with John Feliciano, I really don't care. He shouldn't be in the starting lineup. Um, so yes, draft a guard. Find someone better than John Feliciano. You know what? I think I'm back on the Creed Humphrey bandwagon. And hear me out here. We draft Creed Humphrey, right? And we pull the Eric Wood with Creed Humphrey. We say to Cody Ford, listen, Cody, we think you have a ton of potential at left guard. But we ain't just handing you that job. And you draft a guy like Creed Humphrey at 30, and Creed Humphrey and uh, Cody Ford duke it out at left guard. If Cody Ford wins, you know, Creed Humphrey sits on the bench, learns behind Mitch Morse, can take that job at center uh, down the road. Take if, Feliciano's job. Yeah, take Feliciano's job down the road as well, because that Feliciano contract, we don't know the details of it yet. There could be an out in it. And if Cody Ford, or I'm sorry, if, if uh, Creed Humphrey wins the job, Cody Ford still got two years left on that contract. He can be, you know, your backup swing. Uh, you know, you can maybe pick two positions for him, left guard, right tackle, and just make him the backup at those two positions, make him focus on those two positions. And then when Creed Humphrey slots over to center, you can put Cody Ford back in after another year on the bench and another year to get his mind and his body right. So, hey, there's still hope for Sean McDermott and that wrestling, wrestling offensive lineman. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, we really appreciate you. We still we got 255 people in here, 250 strong. So we really appreciate it. Spread the word, smash that like, tell all your friends. Um, you know, we will even take a pity watch. So anyone who who wants to check us out, um, you know, we're not beyond groveling. So free agency is is a thing, uh, but so is the draft, and I love the draft. So I want to take a little bit of time here to talk about draft season, and you'll notice there are three guys on that image there, and one of them is a running back. So my question to you guys, and Dave, I'll start with you. Who who you got your eye on now at pick 30? Now that pretty much we're bringing we're bringing this team back. We're 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 running them back. Who who are you looking at at 30? You looking at a punter? You looking at a punter? I, I am not looking at a running back. <laughs> that's what you're trying to uh you're trying to egg me on to say uh right now if I'm if I'm at pick 30, I'm looking at a, a cornerback or an edge rusher. Those are the two uh, positions are probably top of my list. Um, your preference do doesn't really matter to me. Uh, obviously, we'll have to see kind of what happens through the rest of free agency. If we bring in any kind of um, CB2 through free agency. But like you said, Steve, I don't expect the Bills to, you know, the Danico Autry thing, like you said, was maybe more of an Addison. Like, would he take a restructure? I don't want to necessarily add another old veteran due to the defensive front so i kind of tend to lean edge rusher here because if i'm thinking how i would love for sort of some of the remaining moves to play out i'd love to see again this see him go out and get a xavier Rhodes for you know a couple million dollars a year um and then go get a young edge rusher uh at pick 30 and i think that those two things you know if you're talking about those are the two biggest deficiencies on this team that's kind of what I'm looking at. And then as a dark horse, as a dark horse option, maybe tight end, maybe tight end. <laughs> maybe a boy, big end. pet. But, but I am not, I am not, I'm actually, I'm with Bruce Snowland on this one. I am not on the running back at 30. I know Marcel is all about ETN at 30. I know Eric from BF, uh, the BF spy is all about ETN. Marcel Louis Jacques. Marcel. Yep. Uh, I am not on the running back at 30 train. I am on edge CB. One of those, maybe tight end as a dark horse. 
Um, I and that's kind of where um that's kind of where my head's at right now before anything else happens in free agency. Yeah, it it should be interesting it, based on the guys we've ha- had conversations with so far, Joseph Asai and um, Joe Tryon. I don't know if I'd be comfortable taking those two at thirty, um, but I think that they could be this year's Cody Ford, a guy that we trade up into the second round. Uh, use maybe some of those fifth round picks to try to move up in the second round and grab one of those two guys. Um, so the Bills could be looking uh, elsewhere at some other positions. Somebody asked, do you think Caleb Farley will drop? Probably not, but Benjamin Albright, who's pretty connected, says the one thing he's noticing in mock draft is Caleb Farley is going higher than he thinks Caleb Farley will go. And Caleb Farley is usually going in the top 15 of a lot of mocks. So according to Benjamin Albright, you know maybe you know Farley is not making it past the top 15. I get it, but Benjamin Albright's pretty connected, and he says that uh, he doesn't think he'll make it. Uh, he, he doesn't think he'll go in that top 15 range. Uh, Jake, what, what are you looking at at pick 30? Okay, so at pick 30, I'm seeing a lot of people still in here uh, trying to buy subscriptions to Express ETN because <laughs> they think – they they think that the running back is the problem at this, and I think if if for some reason the Buffalo Bills are looking at all right, our run game is not as bad as we think it is, but yet they bring back their whole offensive line again. So then you're like, okay, so maybe they don't think that it's that, or maybe do they keep going at a guy that eventually can move in and take over Mitch Morse's spot, which you guys already said in Creed Humphrey. Like maybe they're still kind of playing that game where they're like, yeah, we re-signed this guy, but we don't know how how long they have to get out. Like we don't have those details yet. So maybe if there's an out, they're still going to draft that guy because you know damn well if there is a offensive lineman there that is good, the Chiefs are right behind you and they're going to draft him if you don't. I want, I'd want. i still be happy with Wyatt Davis, honestly. Yeah, well, I, I got Wy- I got Wyatt Davis here, Creed Humphrey. Hey. I've even got Vera Tucker for some reason. John, John Valiciano left guard, Wyatt Davis right guard. Yeah, I've, I have I still think that if it was between those two, you're, I, I still think the guys that we have are perfectly fine back there. And if you gave them a line that could actually open up some more holes and stuff, we've seen that what – they can do sometimes when they get in space. So I think that I'm not buying the running back at 30. I don't, all these people still going like, why would we not do a running back at 30? And it's like, I, I understand that ETN is this talent that Stefan Diggs has come out and said that like, Oh, this guy's going to get Alvin Kamara run for his money or something. It's like, I don't know if I could swallow that pill. And I, I see a lot of people in here also, you know, talking about later in the draft, Tyler Shelvin, who's a guy that I'm, all about but at pick 30 i still think an offensive lineman if that's still what you're thinking of and that if feliciano is someone that you're not ready to absolutely stick with i mean a guy like wyatt davis or creed humphrey you can't go wrong with that yeah i'm i'm off the etn train not because i'm 100 against running back at pick 30 but i don't think etn is even like a top two back in this class i think it's javante and i think it's Najee. i think trez etn is very much a straight line speed guy he gives you a lot but, I mean, find me a highlight where he does anything remotely lateral. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's what scares me about Travis ATN. But, uh, Ryan, where are you leaning to now with all these moves at pick number 30? So, in respects to the running back at 30, I've warmed up to it in the sense that if you're going, if I tell my girlfriend, if she's going grocery shopping, right, and I say, I need some Greek yogurt, you can get store brand, I don't need the Chobani brand. And she goes and she... I want to save some money. And she goes and gets me the Chobani brand. I'm not going to be upset. I like Chobani, right? But it's not efficient. Running back at 30 is not an efficient use of our resources. What I want is I want to stop messing around with our cornerback. I don't want to play a seventh rounder at cornerback. I don't want to play Levi Wallace as a starter at cornerback. They're great depth pieces. Stop messing around with that cornerback two spot. Invest draft capital and 30 if it's milifanyu if it's trading up for jc horn if it's well maybe not trading up for jc horn but jc horn falls if find me someone who can play locked down at that cornerback two spot and i think milifanyu is perfect because he gives you a little bit of flexibility i think he he you can put him inside on dime packages i think you can he can be the kind of that extra DB on the field if you need him to. I think he's a guy who comes in day one 
And he, I think he's like a toy. I think he becomes a toy for Sean McDermott to kind of do a lot of different fun things with. So stop playing seventh rounders there. Stop playing UDFAs there. Stop playing old dudes there. Invest the pick 30. Pick, invest the pick 61 at the latest. Get someone out there opposite of Trey because people don't throw at Trey White. He was the fourth mm. thrown at cornerback in football this year well in coverage the fourth least that means whoever's on that other side of the field is going to get thrown at a ton so even though a guy like levi wasn't terrible when you go by the law of large numbers and he's getting thrown at a ton those numbers are going to look bad so stop messing around draft a cornerback draft someone to play the, the lockdown that side of the field yeah I'm, I'm with you too uh with corner and there's a bunch of names and there have been a ton of names thrown out in the comment section obviously Malin fanwu those local connections. Eric Stokes is a name that's going around a lot. He ran a 4-2-5. I remember back at the beginning of the season when Joe Marino was starting to do his mock drafts, it was Eric Stokes, Eric Stokes, Eric Stokes all the time to the Buffalo Bills. He's a guy who's proven, played in the SEC at Georgia. Greg Newsom is one of my personal favorites from Northwestern. He ran a nice blaze in 42. Everyone's running blaze in 42. Everyone's got NAS up their ass this summer. Uh, so I don't know what's going they're on. Little, they're Everyone's running a 42. They're a little slow on starting that stopwatch, I think. <laughs> Yeah, um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it, these these uh, these forty times are ridiculous. But there's a ton of corners that'll be available to you. Uh, another name the Bills met with was Elijah Molden, who's would be a little bit of a luxury because you think he's more of a Teron Johnson type. But despite being Teron Johnson's size, uh, arguments can be made that he can be used in a number of ways. As even though he's not the size of a big nickel, he can be used as a big nickel. So Elijah Molden is a name I want people to uh, remember when it comes to pick thirty as well. But for me, right now, I want get get me a toy. Get me a toy. Get me a toy. That's what I want. Kadarius Tony, Rondell Moore, Javante Williams, Brevin Jordan, Pat Fryermuth. Get me a toy. Whatever toy you think is fun, whatever toy Brian Dable wants. Brian Dable, you were the assistant coach of the year. You deserve whatever you want. I'm gonna walk you into Toys R Us. I'm gonna let you pick your toy. So whoever's on the board at 30, Brian Dable, pick your toy, whether it's Kadarius Tony, Rondell Moore, Javante Williams, Najee Harris, Pat Fryermuth, give him whatever toy he wants. Speaking of toys, listen, if I would have said this four days ago, y'all be up in my grill telling me I'm a crazy person, but we finally get to have this segment. Oh, baby, could it be trade up season? Trade up season. I'm talking if a player is on the board, whether it be a J.C. Horn, whether it be a Rashad Bateman, whether it be a Jeremiah Owosu Koromoa, if there is what the Buffalo Bills think is a bona fide stud, a bona fide talent, and he slips into the late teens, he slips into the early 20s, my question, I'm going to start with you, Ryan, because you look like you're about to blow a gasket. Would you be willing to trade a first or a second rounder to get up and get – uh, get Koromoa? Would you be able to trade a first and a third rounder? I'm team trade up right now with with the with what we have on our roster starting. You well, look like you're about you're mad at me. Koromoa, no, because what Why is not? It, is this team all of a sudden going to start running three linebacker sets? No, they but he, he can play. He can play Buffalo nickel. The dude is the size of a safety. There are some talks. There are some talks in some circles that he could lose weight and become a safety as opposed to a linebacker. He is a toy. That Leslie, I mean, Leslie Frazier deserves the toys less than Brian Dable. But I'm willing to take Leslie Frazier to Toys R Us too. Buy him a little sympathy gift. So I'll 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 preface it, I guess. If if there's someone, if there's a like holy bleep, how is this guy falling to like 25? And then you want to start Whoa. calling. Like Kyle or, Pitt. <laughs> Kyle Pitt's not gonna he might not get out of the top. I know he's not. I know he's not. So but I'm if he not, did though, I'm not yeah. sure. I'm not trading up to 10. I'm not trading up to 15. Hell, I'm probably not even trading up to 20. If if someone starts falling and it's a Koromoa, if it's a Vera Tucker, if it's a JC Horn, and they get to 25, they get to 24, whatever, then if you start picking up the phones and you can move without maybe jeopardizing other high draft picks, sure. And here's my thinking this year. Bean has shown that he can find talent in the mid round of the draft and Josh Allen sooner than later, assuming he 
keeps the same level of play or a relative same level of play, he is going to be a $40 million quarterback, probably more now with the Dak deal, right? Which means it becomes ever more important to hit on the draft. So yes, it'd be nice to trade up and get a Coromo. It'd be nice to trade up and get a shiny toy like you're saying. But I think it becomes increasingly more important to have swings in the mid round. You need to start to hit on those picks because you're not going to have, no matter how friendly he makes that deal, he's not taking a $25 million deal. Josh Allen's going to be an expensive quarterback, period. Even if he makes it team friendly, it's going to be a large percentage of your cap, the largest percentage of your cap. So give me as many swings as I can the mid round of that draft because you can find talent there. That's how the Patriots did it for years. Like, yeah, Brady was on a team friendly deal, but you need to, you need production out of those picks. So just playing the probability, give me more second, keep those second rounders, keep those third rounders, keep those fourth rounders, keep those fifth rounders and just take swings because the draft is such a crapshoot. Like, you know, all the experts, out there, you know, yeah, you can watch tape, you can watch film, but it is a lot of luck, whether you want to believe that or not. A lot of it's luck. So let's keep keep the odds in our favor, take those swings, keep keep our picks. Jake, you seem you seem like a gambler, man, to me. You seem like you might be willing to get a little reckless. Am I crazy or are you willing to get a little reckless with me? Well, I do do very well in the stock market, so I'm very good at this gambling <laughs> thing. Um, I'm actually team trade down. Um, I'm only trading that pick up if your guys like your JC Horns or your Vera Tuckers, or for some ungodly reason, as some people in the comments are saying, Kyle Pitts was handed to the Buffalo Bills at 30, which would never happen. Uh, if he was there at 25, would I trade up? Yes. But do I think that maybe you can get a guy who's, you know, just as athletic and can make big plays and is really good at separation and Brevin Jordan, who's like who I would say is probably the third best tight end in the draft that you might be able to get in the second round? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I Unless I'm team trade down, if that guy that you're really, really set on, you think that you can get later and you can just get more of those picks to set yourself up in the mid rounds of the draft, which this year are so important because of these people that have opted out and, you know, things just being a little bit weird with not knowing if a player is, uh, what is it? Evaluation and things like that being a little bit weird this year, maybe being able to hit more in those mid rounds. I mean, like, like Ryan said, I mean, the Bills, we've done fairly well at it, and the Patriots did it for years, and I don't see why unless for some reason there is some mega stud there, like about five picks ahead that you should you know, trade future assets to try to get that guy unless he's going to be a bona fide stud coming into the league. All right. Dave, you seem to be the, the, the guy who always balances me out, so I feel like you're probably not going to be on my side here, but give me give me this take: trade up, trade down. Wait, wait, trade up, trade down. Stay where you're at. What, what uh, where, where are you heading here? I think that there are certain positions I would trade up for. Okay, so if the Bills fell in love with, let's say, Jalen Phillips, right, and as a young edge guy, and they really love Jalen Phillips, and they fell in love with him, and they want to trade up for him, I could I could get on board with that. Quitty pay, same type of thing. If they fell in love, let's just say a Rashad Bateman started falling and they fell in love with him, fine. I don't think that I would – I don't think that there – I don't think I would trade up for like a corner or a linebacker or someone like that. I think for me it would have to be like an edge guy, a, a playmaking type of, uh, of toy as you put it, right? I don't want to necessarily trade up for something that I feel is like – it, it's always a luxury, right, to trade up, but it would be more of a luxury to tra- trade up for a JOK. I feel like, right? I I know he's awesome, but like I'm not I'm not into kind of trading up for like a JC Horn. I like a lot of corners in this draft. Like I'd rather just stick at thirty and take Melon Fonwu if you're going to do that. Um, now, what I will say, Steve, to to kind of maybe try to take your side a little bit here is I would be open to trading out of thirty potentially getting a couple extra picks and then maybe 
maneuvering again later in the draft to move back up in certain spots, right? If there's guys that are falling, let's say in the second round or the early third round, I think I'd be, I definitely would be okay with that. Now, the one thing I would say is that, um, I think at the end of the day, what I would be fine with is trading up as long as there weren't any 20, 22 picks involved. I think if you keep it confined to the 2021 draft, I could, I could wrap my head around that being okay and justify it if, if, you know, in my own head, even though I necessarily wouldn't want to, unless it was for a specific player. The other thing we need to consider here is like, let's look at Brandon Bean's track record during drafts. Now, outside of drafts, he's been able to accumulate picks and kind of put the bills in composition by having a lot of picks in, in, in prior drafts in this draft, he's going in with the standard seven picks, albeit it was, it's two sixths and no, and there's no fourth. I don't know if he's going to feel the, the need maybe to be as aggressive as he has in, in drafts past where during drafts, he's always traded up. He's never really traded down during the drafts, right? He's collected mm -hmm. picks outside of the drafts and then he's traded up in the draft itself. So the history would say that come draft day, if we go into the draft with those seven picks, the history would say that we're probably not going to trade down. We're actually more likely to trade up. So, you know, statistically, I'd say you're probably more likely to be right in this case than, than not um, as far as if there is a trade involving the bills. Yeah. Uh, seems like here that, you know, I'm the only one in this group who's willing to be the wild card, bitches! Yeah! No, I mean, like, if, they, if Bateman's there or if Jalen Phillips is there and they want to go up and get him, go ahead. Be, I'm just, be my guest. I'm just looking for a player that's going to answer this question. Can you take me higher? That's all I want. Just want a player to take me higher. That's all I want. Oh, here you go. We got Jeff. some some. Oh, we got Jeff King in the house. What's going on, Jeff? Uh, Jeff is coming in, uh, and he's coming in fire with the toy. He says, "How about we get a toy at running back? Because our suck, <laughs> Moss Singletary, and fuck the stats. They don't put fear in any D coordinator <laughs> game plan. They're non-existent, and that's what you want and need. I will say there is some truth to that. There, like yes. these guys don't instill fear in anybody. As like. Are they good? Are they adequate? Sure. Are they instilling fear into anybody? No, they are not. So I will agree with Jeff. Yeah, that. and you know who would instill some fear? My RB1, and that's Javante Williams at 30. Yeah, I love I, 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 I get some power McCoy with that. Like McCoy with a little bit of oomph is the vibe I get from Javante Williams. I would be stoked because I know the Bills are looking at UNC. They had their eyes on Daz Newsome. Maybe they got maybe – maybe that's, that's just a – that's just a – he kind of like I'm not like a, a red herring for uh, he just trying to of, what, what's he we're looking for? Me? Decoy, uh, decoy, yeah. He re honestly, he reminds me. Daz is of like, of why do you guys keep asking me about Devonte? <laughs> Javante? <laughs> he reminds me of AP a little bit. I'm not gonna lie. Ooh, I, I'm less. I, I, I Ooh. He's, a better receiver. Ooh. he's a better receiver probably than AP. Although AP did a decent job receiving uh, in throughout his career, he was never known for that necessarily, but. He kind of gives me like AP vibes. I don't know. Like that's just kind of who I think about when I watch Javante. Wow. Can, can I respond to the Devin Singletary slander? Is that oh, allowed? Oh, okay, yeah. Devin Go Singletary. We forget. We're so quick to get out on Devin Singletary. Devin Singletary led the league in yak as a rookie. Yeah, he's not slow. Oh, yeah, he's slow. Yeah, he's not flashy. But he's shifty. He led. He looked incredibly solid. Had he played 16 games as a rookie? He would have rushed for a thousand yards over the first five games when the bills could actually rush the ball. When Cody Ford was on that line, they could rush the ball. I don't get, I mean, I understand why it was frustrating, but I'm not out on Devin Singletary. I'm not out on Zach Moss. They're both guys who early in this year, they were able to run the ball with them. They were able to run the ball against new England. They were able to run the ball against the chargers. Did I think to move the Devin Singletary slander and the move on from Devin Singletary, the move on from Zach Moss, I think they had the potential to get back to what at least Devin Singletary was in 2019 it was, and a guy who's you're not going to use a ton, but a guy that will be efficient. I think they can both be high-efficiency backs in the way this offense is, and I think getting back to a run scheme that benefits the offensive line, getting back to those pin and pulls where you're getting 
Uh, Mitch Morris out in space, I think will be paramount. I think I'll go on record as this too. You can come at me, come find me. Devin Singletary and Zach Moss are going to have bounce back years in 2021. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I, you know what? Like, I keep thinking, like, all right, time to wrap it up. It's been our half. We got 280 people in here right now. We got absolutely insane. You guys are freaking spectacular. Some might even say that you are all stars. And if you want to be an all star, you can smash that like button. Uh, you know, 280 people in the chat, 280 likes. It would uh, it would be super appreciated. Believe me, I'm not I'm not beneath I'm not beneath begging for your likes. So please is that what Steve you. from Smash Mouth looks like now? And his name is Steve. Yeah, dude. Honestly, he looks better than he yeah. looks in the '90s. He looks Bro, better. Like I'm he's got that remember. nice it, like it might be the walk man on the haircut. Sun. Yeah. It might I don't be the know, walk from someone or the girl comes up to. Are you Steve from Smash Mouth? He looks <laughs> he's like, like he's been he's walking like, on the sun a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I saw it and I'm like, is that what he looks like now, man? All right. Just for so, a reason to smash the like. One final question before we go. The Buffalo Bills still have some UFAs. TJ Yeldon, Taiwan Jones, Isaiah McKenzie, Andre Roberts, Tyler Croft, uh, Ty Secchi, Darren Lee, Kenny Stills, even though they're technically already off the roster. Uh, the Bills still have some Dean Marlowe. The Bills still have some UFAs. And they also have some RFAs and Ike Bucker, Corey Bohorquez, and Levi Wallace. If you are Brandon Bean, which one of these, which which of these guys, it can be more than one. Uh, and Dave, I'll start with you. Which of these guys are you looking to bring back? Uh, I'm probably looking to bring, well, I'm going to put this in the context of what we have cap wise right now. I probably would be looking to bring back three guys. I'd probably be tendering Levi Wallace, or if I'm not tendering, I'm going to try to re-sign him cheaper. Um, if he does hit the open market, I'm going to try to bring back Butker, uh, again, same situation of, I'm not tendering him. I'm going to try to bring him back once he hits the open market and I'm going to try to bring back Andre Roberts. I mean, I know people like McKenzie because they feel like he can do a little bit of both, but like Andre Roberts is on another is, is from a return game perspective. How nice was it the last couple of years to have Andre Roberts back there with the consistency dude averaged 30 yards per kick return in 2020. Uh, that was the highest in the league for anyone who had more than two kick returns uh, in the season. So if you can bring back Andre Roberts for like one year, $1 million or one year, $1.5 million, uh, I'd like to see him back. And then I'd like to see Butker and, and Levi Wallace back. If for nothing else, giving you flexibility heading into the draft. And if, you know, guys don't fall to you that you want, or if guys, it doesn't work out like the trades or whatever, you you still have those guys uh as you know as a cushion so those would probably be the three yeah we got (laughs) muff turkey one average gaming coming in saying hey guys love the show massive builds fan from scotland uh glad you like the show uh and i'm glad you didn't see in uh scotland muff Turkey. yeah and i uh yeah, does muff turkey mean something different in Scotland? I'm just glad you didn't leave because we lost about 25 people when I started begging for likes. I'm going to stop doing that, I think. Uh, but thank you. And, uh, you know, Jake, we're going to move on to you. Who are some uh, of the Bills' UFAs, RFAs you want to see the Buffalo Bills bring back? Okay, so if we're talking just like straight right away, I think that Dean Marlowe is always going to be on a Sean McDermott team. <laughs> yeah. I don't I, – I think – Dean Marlowe's going to hit the open market and then he's going to be back playing for peanuts for the Buffalo Bills again, because I don't see any other team going out and actually picking up Dean Marlowe. But then you've got guys like Bohorquez, who they're saying might just be the next guy that they already bring back in. And then I, Dave thinks I, I, it's a luxury to have Andre Roberts with the 30 yards per kick return. I think that, and I think that Andre Roberts bring him back. I, Again, I lean more towards Isaiah McKenzie. Yes, it's been a luxury having Andre Roberts. It depends on what deals you're getting them on. Uh, I definitely think that Isaiah McKenzie could have that ability returning that Andre Roberts could have in time, but that's not really proven as of yet. That's kind of just the thing that somebody can believe in. Let me ask you this, Jake. Go ahead. If If it's a tie game in the AFC Championship game, and the Bills are going to get the ball back with like a minute and a half to go, and we're forcing a punt, 
and that and Andre Roberts or, or no, it's not Andre. It, whoever it is has to catch yep. the punt like the fifteen or their own fifteen, the Bills' own fifteen or ten yard line, and they mm-hmm. absolutely have to catch it and not fumble it. Who do you want to catch that punt? <laughs> Ooh. You don't want Isaiah McKenzie. Isaiah McKenzie has had ball security issues in the mm. past or in on punt returns. I'm not like I'm not disagreeing that he doesn't have the yeah. potential, but I I don't feel 100 percent confident with the ball security. I know and I know I'm not, not going to make this assumption based off the one that one punt return that Isaiah McKenzie took to the house, which is one more than Andre Roberts did all year. Mm-hmm. Sure. But um, I'm definitely going to go off, and I think that that ability is there. But in that situation right now, whoever it is, yeah, I'm probably going to go with Andre Roberts at this moment, at the skill level that they are right now and yeah. what I know. That was a leading Andre question. Uh, that was a leading question. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. All right, Ryan, how about you? Who, who you? who are you bringing back from that group? So if we're doing three like you did, I'm gonna gotta show some love. You kind of just brushed him off. Punter's lives matter. You gotta bring back Bojo. He's a weapon, important part of the team. The highest paid punter in the league is Thomas Morissette, three point seven million. He's not gonna get that. Tender him, whatever you gotta do, get him back here. Number two, Andre Roberts. I think that is um, like you said. He he plays that field position game. I know McKenzie had that touchdown, but Roberts is. Solid handed. He always seems to find the yards that are there. He always seems to find a couple extra. He just, when, when you're playing, those yards add up over time, especially over the course of a game, over the course of a season. And then this one might be less popular because I've been talking about needing to upgrade CB2, but I'm bringing back, I'm tendering, I'm resigning, whatever it is, Levi Wallace. I think when you're looking at cornerback, it's kind of like, when you're looking at tiers of cornerback, that's kind of like looking at tiers of offensive line. You have elite, you have above average, you have average. And then once you get below that average tier, it can be hot garbage. And when you have hot garbage at cornerback or when you have hot garbage online, it is super noticeable and it can derail your game plan. Whether we draft someone, whether we sign someone else to play CB1, whether Dane Jackson is CB1, I want someone in there who's at least a passable cornerback. And Levi Wallace statistically is a passable cornerback. So if he's cheap, if it's tender, if it's 2 million, whatever it is, get Levi Wallace back on this team. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty much, uh, my take here is Bojo is all I need back. Bojo is all I need back. Oh, never and, thought I'd see the day. Never and, thought I'd see that. that <laughs> uh, Damon really Talbot, good. Damon Talbot from draft diamond says the bills and, and Corbel Herquez are already in conversations. Um, my guess is Corey Bohork, My guess is the Buffalo Bills are offering him something south of the two million dollars that he'll be making, and he wants to test the market. But to me, lock down Corey Bohorquez, get the young kicker, get the young punter under contract uh, for term, uh, and you have obviously Reed Ferguson your long snapper, and there's very little you have to worry about. Everyone else, let them go, let them go, let them set them free. And if it's meant to be, they will come back. Isn't that from like a movie or something? If it's meant to be, they'll come back. Let them test the market because right now, like you look, you saw the contract Nathan Peterman got one year, uh, like three million dollars or whatever. Like that's Matt Barkley. Matt Barkley's thinking, well, Nathan Peterman's getting three million dollars. Give me one year, two point five. You know, Andre Roberts is like, oh, I'm one of the best return men in the game. Give me one year, two million. Like all these different players are like, all right, I, I, I want to go see what I can get. Let them test the market, and guess what? If someone offers them that money, good for you. Bye bye. You are a replacement level player. We can find someone on the scrap heap to come in and do the same exact thing you did. However, three weeks go by, four weeks go by. Matt Barkley's phone ain't exactly ringing off the hook. Andre Roberts' phone ain't exactly reading off the hook. Mike Bucker's phone not ringing off the hook. Dean Marlowe, one year, one million. Matt Barkley, one year, one million. Andre Roberts, you know, one year, like 1.5 million. Uh, you know, Ike Bucker, one year, 800K. Dean Marlowe. I'll take them for that. You know, the, the, that that's what I'm willing to pay them, what they're damn worth, and not a cent more. And uh, the Buffalo Bills have an opportunity this year with such a saturated market and with such little money uh, to play some hardball with some of these bottom of the roster guys. And I think the Buffalo Bills, no offense, should take advantage of it. So, uh, you know, if, if I'm the Buffalo Bills, it's Bojarquez and then everyone else. Bye-bye. Bye. Uh, so that is it, ladies and gentlemen. What a show it has been. 
Uh, Ryan, I want to give you uh, the stage here to tell the people where they can find you and where they can find your work. Find me. You can find me personally at Sports Rock 2 on Twitter. Just a bunch of bills and other nonsense going on. Syracuse just made the tournament, so I'll probably be tweeting about that a lot. Um, you can follow our show at 585 Report. We drop every Saturday afternoon. We're on Spotify. We're on Apple, wherever you get your podcasts. You can also put that into Twitter at 58 Report on Twitter, at 585 Report on Instagram. Um, you can follow my co host at Mitchell Broder. We represent Rochester. We try to go in depth and uh, come interact with us. We're growing. We're getting bigger. We, we'd love to talk to you. Jeff King's coming for you here. He says he ain't Barry Sanders, buddy, when it comes to Devin Singletary. So give me a break. You want efficiency or you want fear? Efficiency. Efficient. <laughs> oh my god! Efficient use of resources. I love it. This is good. We should we should get Jeff on. Just have a Jeff and Ryan just duke it out, mano y mano. Uh, pay per view. That would be a pay per view event, I think. Mm. Jake, let the people know where they can find you. Okay, well, on Twitter, you can find me at Jake the Bills fan, where I pretty much talk about everything and all the teams that I follow that stink. And uh, I also have a YouTube channel that you could go look at right now. It's called Jake Jordan. It's just my name. I talk about the Bills. I make Bills memes. I put uh, hype videos out there. I do everything. It's all around Bills channel. And uh, actually, this week, I'm going to be trying to pull a Josh Allen rookie card out of some old packs. So make sure to (laughs) go try to look at that while I waste my money trying to pull one of these cards. And, uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Jake the Bills fan. I host the Jordan Hour, which is an affiliate channel podcast for the Buffalo Fanatics. It drops on Wednesday mornings, uh, usually pretty early in the morning. And it's usually me and my brother, and we talk about sports and everything like that. And there's also a chance that we put on Twitter, and there's our second half of our shows are always the PQ section, which is the people's question section, where we take people's questions and we answer that. And, you know, the things that everybody wants to know, we talk about it. So we dedicate a whole half of our show to that. And you can find that on Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast at. Dave, you got your you got yourself a little show on Monday and Thursday nights, don't you? Just a little show, uh, you know, <laughs> just a little show going on. And look, I mean, tomorrow's going to be big. We got the air raid hour Mondays and Thursdays with, with you driving uh, that show, and it's uh, it's been really good. We obviously rebranded to the air raid hour back in the, during the season, but it's uh, I've really I've really liked the rebrand, man. It's been going well, and um, I think this week's going to be. I mean, we're going to probably talk a lot about some of the stuff we talked about today, but there's going to be news tomorrow, probably even tonight into tomorrow. So uh, Monday is going to be a big one, kind of setting the setting the scene. And then Thursday, uh, I think we're going to try to get Jeff Landers on. To Ooh. Get Jeff Landers on the show with us um, of Buffalo tailgate hosting fame, um, Buffalo Fanatics tailgate hosting fame uh, to join us to talk free agency because by Thursday, Whew, there's going to be a lot that has happened. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so that'll be fun this week. That's going to be I, really good. I think one of the underrated things we can talk about this week, too, is what our division rivals do. So, uh, like, that that could be – it'll be really interesting to see how the Dolphins, who uh, let to go to very good players and Kyle Van Oy and Shaq Lawson this week, how what they do, uh, how the Jets go and attack free agency, how the Patriots go and attack, attack free agency. So it should be fun. Well, gentlemen, I'm not going to lie to you. I did not expect to push two hours tonight, but it has been real. It has been awesome. People in the comment section, you guys make the show what it is. I mean, there was just as good of a conversation going on in the chat section as there was over here on screen. So kudos to you guys. Bills Mafia is by far the best fan base and by far one of the most educated fan base. And this show, this platform, Buffalo Fanatics, we'd be nothing, absolutely nothing, without you guys. So believe me when I say we appreciate you guys and all you do way more uh, than you appreciate what we're doing here on screen. So kudos to you guys. Give yourselves a round of applause, a pat on the back. You guys are the true, uh, you know, BFMVPs. And we will sign off as we always sign off. And we'll, we will go me to Dave, to Ryan, to Jake, just a simple go Bills. Go Bills. Go Bills. Go Bills. Go Bills.